And somehow, though he has gone up into heaven, they are looking up into heaven a little bit too long. And two men come down and say, Men of Galilee, why are you looking up into heaven? Do you not know that this Jesus Christ, he is going to come back? He will come back as he said. He is going up into heaven now, and he shall return. Our Lord Jesus Christ said these words also, says St. Gregory the Great. Here an angel tells him these words, though our Lord himself said it to them. Notice also the supper. There was a supper before our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, and there was a supper before he went into heaven. On the supper before he was crucified, there was the institution of the Holy Sacrifice to Mass, consecrated them bishops, made them priests, they gave them the sacred Holy Communion. But also during the course of that supper, he spoke of his divine love, and he spoke of the Father. And he spoke the most beautiful words that he ever spoke in his entirety of his life on earth, which are recorded in the Gospel of St. John. Most beautiful words, followed by a very sorrowful departure. Become 43 days later. And St. Luke tells us that when he sat down to suffer on Holy Ascension Thursday, he upbraided the apostles and he chastised them. That's how this day began. He sat down to lunch, principal meal of the day, and he yelled at them. He said, why do you not believe the testimony of the true witnesses? You saw the holy women, that they were trustworthy, they were not fools, and they saw the tomb empty. You, Thomas, saw the witnesses all speak to you clearly, and you did not believe. And he upbraided all of the eleven remaining apostles for their slowness of belief, and that was the subject of his conversation before he ascended into heaven. So on the 43 days before, 44 days before, he spoke words of divine love. Now he chastises his apostles. St. Leo the Great tells us, consider the chastisement of Christ. Our Lord chastises his apostles multiple times. And every time that he chastises them, they never run away, they're never afraid, and nothing bad ever happens. It isn't so difficult or so hard or so bad to be chastised by Christ, those who love him. He upbraided his apostles, but there is some way in which Christ upbraids, some way in which he expresses his anger. I am really angry. I am really mad. I can't believe you did this. But what do the apostles hear? They hear the divine and most sacred heart that is speaking. He is instructing his apostles that they have made a mistake, that they have not done well in not understanding and not believing as they should. Then St. Leo the Great writes, Holy Pope, these apostles doubted, not just St. Thomas, but they all doubted. And our Lord upbraided them for their doubt. And yet, I am most grateful for their doubt. It is interesting how the chastisement of Christ is. Remember that our Lord, when he oftentimes he performed a miracle, he would say, don't tell anyone about it. Keep it a secret. And every time he told them, they disobeyed. They did not keep it a secret. And then there were his disciples who would often tell others, I am the representative of Christ. 
You should obey me. And it's true that this is normally the case. Our Lord said, He who hears you hears me. But yet we see in the very gospel itself, the apostles go to the leper, the apostle go to the men that are sick on the side of the road and say, Be quiet, Christ is coming. Leave our Lord Jesus Christ alone. There are no more room for people in this house. You have to be satisfied. But they were not satisfied. They dug a hole in the roof. They did not listen. They cried with a loud voice. And here is one of the mysteries of the apostleship of our Lord Jesus Christ and the chastising of Christ. When child Christ chastises, we must listen. And when Christ chastises, we must not listen. There will be times when we will listen to Christ and times when we do not. Our Lord Jesus Christ chastises the apostles. He told them how much of a failure that they were. He told them how their lack of faith was. He told them how they were doing not well, not doing well. And after he had chastised them, he then ascended into heaven. Are these the right final words? Is it fitting that his final words and his peace on earth to his friends are, wake up, understand your faith better, pay attention to the signs. Here we see that the heart of Moses is the heart of Jesus Christ. What were Moses' final words before he died whom sacred scripture says there was no man like unto him before him nor until the end of the word. And Moses' final sermon we read about in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 32 he is chastising the Jews. He's telling them they are stiff-necked. He's telling them that they will disobey as soon as he dies. He's telling them today you're good but tomorrow you're going to be bad. And he tells them one bad thing after another. And after he had chastised them, he then died and disappeared from their midst. And all the Jews wept because Moses was gone. The Lord, the Scripture, the fathers of the church tell us that Moses was filled with meekness and he was so meek and so gentle that he was simply called the meek one. And when the meek one chastised the Jews, they heard his heart rather than his words. And each time he told them, for instance, you are a stiff-necked people, people. You are going to disobey. You won't be turned away. But every time you repent, God will come back to you. Here is one of the tests of love and the test of the stability of our supernatural love. What do we do when we are chastised? By God. What do we do when we are chastised by the men of God? By the Holy Father in his encyclicals and his writings, not the ones of Vatican II, which are straight from hell, but all the ones that come before that. What do we do when we are chastised by our masters who represent God? These things do not cause sadness in those that love him. Then why is it? I want to know what Jesus Christ sees is wrong because I love him. And I want to know how I can maybe fix a little something here and fix a little something there that I might go closer to him. And I also know that the Lord Jesus Christ does not chastise me except in order to make me grow. And here it is that our Lord said in the Gospel. For that tree which bears fruit, I'm going to trim it. The tree that does not bear fruit, it's not trimmed. The tree is cut down, and the whole tree 
tree is thrown in the fire. But the tree that bears fruit, I'm going to cut it. I'm going to trim it. I'm going to chastise it. This is the tree I love. If only we can understand what is the beauty of chastisement. If we don't get out of that, we don't experience an upbraiding, then it is most certain that we are not the friends of God. The apostles have finally learned. When the apostles were chastised every time before, they got upset. But now they're chastised and they're not upset at all. And then our Lord Jesus Christ ascends to heaven and he's gone. But they're not disturbed. Because now these 11 men are truly becoming all pair Christians. They were ordained. 43 days before, 44 days before, they received the power of priesthood. But they weren't yet fully priests. Now they are beginning to understand what it means to be priests. And they are becoming truly altar priests. Now what happens when the Lord Jesus Christ ascends into heaven? And they are really becoming other Christs. Immediately they get to work. Now here again we see the disobedience of the followers of Christ. Our Lord tells them, you will, you will be a witness to me all over the world. In Judea, in Samaria, and all about the entire world. But wait here until you are baptized in the Holy Ghost. So they have nine days to wait. They don't know when the Holy Ghost is going to come. He will come on Pentecost. As they gather together, St. Peter then says, There were originally 12 of us. There were 12 apostles. There must still be 12, the scripture may be fulfilled. For there were 12 tribes, there must be 12 apostles. And right now we are only 11, because Judas has betrayed. And Judas has gone to his own place. These are the last words in sacred scripture spoken about Judas, which are the last words we spoke about every soul that is damned. And St. Peter says those words. He says, Judas betrayed, and Judas is wicked, and Judas has failed, and Judas has gone to his own place. We were made to go to God's place. We were made to see God face to face. Judas was made a priest of God. He was made another Christ. But he decided that his own place was better because the priesthood for him was only the job that was given to him that he might make it through this world. He was a hireling. And he wasn't getting paid enough. And so therefore he was a thief also. And being a hireling and a thief, he very quickly and very easily betrayed Jesus Christ for his own personal benefit that he might have his own little joy, his own little peace, his own little possessions, his own little kingdom here on earth. Behold, he has gone to his own place which is called hell. And these are the last words spoken about Judas and they're spoken on Ascension Thursday. But then St. Peter says, there must be twelve. Therefore we must choose amongst us those other young men that were with us during these entire three years since the baptism of St. John, who were witnesses of everything that we also witnessed, that there might be truly twelve witnesses of the resurrection, twelve witnesses of the ascension, twelve witnesses of the crucifixion, Twelve witnesses of his teaching that he gave us in the night, and twelve witnesses of the journeys on the boat, twelve witnesses of the miracles that happened during the course of the three and a half years that they've been with Jesus Christ.
Christ. And they chose two, Joseph and Matthias. And they drew lots. The lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered among the twelve. So that when the Holy Ghost would descend nine days later, ten days later, he would not descend upon eleven apostles, he would descend upon twelve apostles. And who was the one that made sure there was a twelve apostle? It was St. Peter. Here we see that what is the effect of having Jesus Christ in our hearts? The desire to increase and multiply. It is the command that he gave to Adam twice, before the fall and after the fall. He told them to increase and multiply. He gave them the whole human race again after the, after the flood. Increase and multiply and people the earth. There's something about increasing and multiplying which is the sign of love and the sign of fidelity. As St. Gregory the Great says, we are called shepherds, we priests of God. And the chief shepherd is called the good shepherd. Now what is the sign of a good shepherd? A good shepherd is one that takes a small flock and makes it into a big flock. He is one that increases the flock. He is one that is always trying to improve and strengthen the flock. Therefore, it is necessary for the shepherd to always strive to increase the flock. To take the love of Jesus Christ and the faith of Jesus Christ and bring it wherever it is not. Now this heart has finally filled the apostles. It's finally inside of them. And they needed the 40 days between Ascent Christmas, between Easter Sunday and Ascension Thursday to verify and completely know without any doubt for the rest of all history that the man Jesus Christ had truly and physically died on the cross truly and physically arose. Now what is one of the great heresies of the last hundred years, which is part of modernism? The modernists teach that the Jesus of history did not rise from the dead. I met one priest about 15 years ago who I thought was the most Catholic, the most theological, he was studying a PhD as a priest in Nigeria, extremely intelligent, doctor of philosophy, doctor of theology, and he knew St. Thomas backwards and forwards. And he knew all the teachings of St. Pius X, etc. He was incredibly unknowledgeable of the tradition. And I was speaking with him for three hours straight about the faith. I said, this priest is amazing. He knows everything about the faith. Why is he saying the new mass? And then, after three hours in, he switched and he became exceedingly angry. And he said, wait a minute. I said, what do you mean, wait a minute? And he said to me, you think, don't tell me that you think that the Jesus we're talking about for the last three hours is the Jesus of history. So what do you mean? The Jesus of history, the physical Jesus, he didn't rise from the dead. He didn't perform miracles. It's the Jesus of faith that did all those things. And I told them there was no difference between the Jesus of faith and the Jesus of history and the real and true physical Jesus rose from the dead. Next two hours, we're trying to kill each other. Now the fact is, it's interesting that for those first three hours, it seemed so clear that he was truly a man of faith. But he had no faith. Why is it? St. Leo the Great, St. Gregory the Great, and St. Peter, three popes, Tell us, without the resurrection and the proof of the resurrection during the course of these 40 days, our faith is in vain. The reason why we know that Jesus Christ really is 
God. And every man, woman, and child on earth must enter into his mystical body, which is called our Holy Mother, the Catholic Church. And why every man, woman, and child was made to see God face to face. And he cannot see God face to face unless he obeys Jesus Christ in his holy teaching and his holy church. The only reason that we can say with absolute certainty and the only reason we can say that it's true is because that man, Jesus Christ, really and truly and physically died on Good Friday. He was really and truly buried in a tomb. And the same Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Hence, St. Leo the Great says, before he ascended into heaven, he sat down and ate. To make it clear, it was his body that went to heaven. He ate food in the presence of his apostles. They watched him eat. It was his true physical body. And that same physical body had died 43 days earlier. And that same physical body rose 40 days earlier. And that same physical body today on Ascension Thursday is going physically up into heaven. And it's a physical journey up. During right before the consecration of the Mass. In the Queen for the Eight, prayer just before this is my body. The priest is instructed. St. Thomas Aquinas tells us, the Ugarian of the Bronx, the early 20th century, says, this is a dogma, and it is a physical fact. We are instructed by somebody who holds our Christ in Mass, who the day before he suffered, he lifted his eyes up into heaven to his eternal Father. And Holy Mother Church says, when the priest says these words, he has to take his eyes and look up. He does not look up at the cross. Every other time in the Mass, when the priest looks up, he looks at the cross, the crucifix. But at this time, he is instructed with his eyes. Look up. Who the day before he suffered, lifted his eyes to his eternal father. And St. Thomas tells us, Gary LeBron's greatest of the theologian of the 20th century says, this is real, physical, and literal. God the Father is really, physically, in his most perfect divine presence, located in the empyrean heaven up. And Jesus Christ, when he broke the bread on Holy Thursday, when he broke the bread, his apostles watched him break the bread. And then he turned his head up and looked to his heavenly Father. And they were, they were amazed by that. He looked to his heavenly Father. It's the first ceremony of the Mass passed down to us by Jesus Christ himself. You don't even notice it during the Holy Sacrifice. But what did theologians say in the last century? The body of Jesus Christ didn't physically go up. On Ascension Thursday, it spiritually went up. Our religion is physical, and Jesus Christ is physical. And when he lifted his eyes to heaven, from that day forward, when every priest celebrates the holy sacrifice of the past, he lifts his eyes to heaven. Because heaven really is up, and hell really is down in the center of the earth. And Jesus Christ really and truly ascended on the day, this day called Ascension Thursday. He really did descend into heaven. And his heart remained in St. Peter. And his heart remained in the eleven apostles. And before this day was out, St. Peter gathered together and said, there must be twelve Judas has gone to his own place. Let him be forgotten. He has missed out on joy. He's missed out on peace. He's missed out on all forms of happiness. He shall be remembered forever as the traitor, as the one who has betrayed God in the most perfect and complete manner. 
since he was not only a child of God, he was a priest of God. And he completely abandoned him and betrayed him to the world and betrayed him to the priests and betrayed him to all others, to Satan himself. He has gone to his own place. Now let Matthias take his place, whom the Holy Ghost has chosen, and St. Matthias will take his place. St. Barnabas would also be a saint, St. Joseph Barnabas, but not an apostle. And so, St. Matthias was chosen to take his place on this day. And notice, why is there no sadness? Why is there no sorrow? Because Christ has left himself here on earth. And he wants us to be the carriers of his name, the carriers of his faith, and the carriers of his physical body in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and the Blessed Sacraments to the very ends of the earth. We must remember that it's a Jesus of history who is the real Jesus, and there is no other Jesus. So on this day of the Ascension, we ask to take on the spirit of the Apostles. Let that spirit be inside of us. And remember that one of the texts, do I love God? Am I in His army? How do I react when I am afraid my praise? What is in my heart when I am attacked, when I am afraid, when I am chastised, when I am corrected? Those who love Jesus Christ maintain peace in their hearts. Those who are the enemies of God are filled with anger and bitterness. Our Lord Jesus Christ, when he shows to make his final words, upbraiding words, they were words for only those who love him. And he did not upbraid on this day the enemies. He upbraided them in other times. He upbraided his friends. We must understand that if we are the friends of Christ, we must be spanked once in a while. We must be pruned once in a while. And this should not overly disturb us. We should have great peace in our hearts. Because when Christ ascends, he shall return. And when Christ ascends, he leaves his heart and his faith behind with us. And when Christ ascends, he does not say, wait till I get back. But get busy. We must continue working and spreading his kingdom and continue our work. And then the time will come when he returns to judge the living and the dead. And his flesh shall return, and not just his spirit. And his human mouth and his human body shall judge every single one that's ever been on this earth, those on his left and those on his right, at the very ending of the world. The prayer for that day, I believe, in firmly his resurrection and firmly in his ascension of the real and true Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, who is now in the heaven at the right hand of the Father, in the imperial heaven, with the blessed Mary, physically, also, in the kingdom of heaven, awaiting the end of the world, when all other bodies shall be united to the souls, and shall come to the valley of Joseph out to be judged. And between now and then, let us spread the kingdom of Christ, Believe firmly in his word, in his teaching, in his acts. This is what's necessary for us in this life and nothing else.